All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining our seminar today. For your information, the seminar is being recorded and will be made available on the REMPLEX webpage. And as a reminder, we request that you please keep yourself muted during the presentation and Q&A. My name is Alicia Gorton with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, or PNNL, and I'll be moderating today's seminar on behalf of the Center for the Remediation of Complex Sites, or REMPLEX. REMPLEX is a PNNL platform that couples unique core competencies and expertise with state-of-the-art facilities and physical assets to deploy, mature, and develop technologies to solve complex issues related to contaminated subsurface environments. And today's seminar by Deb Fagan and Lisa Newburn of PNNL will discuss Visual Sample Plan or VSP, which is a geospatial software tool that supports the development of a defensible sampling plan for environmental remediation. Based on statistical sampling theory and the statistical analysis of sample results, VSP supports confident decision-making. Deb and Lisa will cover how VSP couples site, building, and sample location, visualization capabilities with optimal sample design and statistical analysis strategies. And Deb Fagan is a PNNL statistician since 2001. She focuses on statistical solutions to environmental, radiological detection and non-proliferation research questions. And Lisa Newburn is a PNNL software developer for VSP. She has 16 years of experience developing tools and providing instruction for applying statistically based systematic planning to environmental sampling. And so after the presentation today, I'll facilitate a Q&A with Deb and Lisa. So I encourage you to type any questions that you have into the chat box during the presentation. And so with that, I will turn it over to Lisa to kick us off. Lisa? All right, thanks so much, Alicia. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. We really appreciate the opportunity. So I'll start out with um, just going over. So first off, just as an overview of the presentation, we'll start. I'll start off with talking about what is VSP, um, and then go through some of the radiological applications as well as how VSP can be used for geospatial analysis. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the upcoming developments, some of the things that we have um, coming up as for for VSP. So what Visual Sample Plan fundamentally is, is a software tool with a few key objectives. So this first one is to design, is, is to be used to design a statistically based sampling strategy. So this is in the case where you want to know, you really want to know how many samples should be collected and where. And this is all kind of based on the data quality objectives process. So the idea of um, ensuring that before sampling takes place, that it's being done in a way and with sufficient sampling to be able to have high confidence in the specific decision of interest. So this is a, a dialogue of VSP that um, goes, goes through how the parameters are entered in order to, in order to come up with that, that number of samples. And it's all very decision driven and based off of what is the objective of your sampling? Why are you doing the sampling? And specifically, what kind of quantitative statement do you want to make once, once you have results? And then the next, the next phase here is analyzing data to support decisions. So once there's data available, once there's results, um, performing statistical tests, looking at graphs, plots, and summary statistics. So there's a number of different tools for data analysis and, and testing the data. And then um, it's also a tool to visualize maps, buildings, plans, sample locations, and results. So there's um, a number of different file formats that can be imported, as well as downloading map imagery in the background, and then tools and visualization options for looking at 3D rooms, buildings with multiple floors, as well as like equipment and furniture. So all of these together make VSP a much more powerful tool for not only coming up with a sample size, but also communicating about a sampling plan, communicating about results, and um, being able to visualize this information in conjunction with the sampling. 
And then the, the last kind of key objective of VSP is to guide users who are not expert statisticians. So the, the kind of, I mean, we have a, a pretty diverse user base, but in general, um, it's, it's geared towards people who do not, who are not statistical experts. They know they want to use statistical sampling on their site. Um, and, and they, but we try to make things as decision driven and free of kind of technical language as possible to make it very easy to use. And then what's shown on the screen to the right here is the automatically generated reports um, that documents all of the steps and assumptions that went into the sampling design, as well as providing references to, to the particular methods that were used so that it's not a black box. It's something that could be shared with others and used to replicate what was done. And so just to give an, an overview of VSP kind of in action, this is what it looks like. And as far as like technical details, so VSP is written in C++, it is Windows only, um, and it's a desktop software tool. So there's features that use an internet connection like to download imagery, but it can be completely standalone and doesn't require, doesn't require any kind of like web communication to function. So the, the first view here shows the map view. So this is where you get that overview of your site plan as well as your, as well as your samples. And then um, the graph view shows some of those diagnostic interactive graphics to look at the performance of the design. And then also, um, since they are interactive, you can change some of the, the aspects of that plot and see how it impacts the, the number of samples required. So, um, yeah, I won't get into too much detail, but for example, you could see like, oh, if I want to have much higher confidence, how would that affect my number of samples? So it's really helpful for kind of evaluating the trade-offs and looking at how you could change your design to be better, better optimized. Next up is this, um, it's this report generator. It can get quite long, especially if you have data, but I think the nice thing about this is this is a, a lot of a lot of text, a lot of documentation about what was done that can be copied and pasted directly into Word, um, and you know either either pieces of it edited and used in reports or just add, added it as an appendix. But um, just instead of having to communicate about how the plan was developed and what was done on your own, you're given this really nice automatic report that that contains pretty much all that information. And then lastly, the coordinate view um, allows you to look at the, the, the coordinates of the planned sample locations, as well as bring in actual sample locations or, or measurement locations. And um, these can be exported to like a GPS device so, so that teams can go out and collect data. So just, yeah, establishing a little more context with VSP, um, looking at the, the downloads and users, we have, we estimate we have around 5,000 unique active users over the past five years. Um, we have about 2,000 downloads each year. One thing I probably should have mentioned first off is that VSP is free, it's freely available. We have um, a registration on our website for us to track these kind of statistics and um, get a better idea of how people are using it. But um, once you have the installer, there's no license or activation, you can just pass that off to anyone else. So based off of our downloads and registrations, these are the numbers we come up with. We have quite a few um, US government agency users, as well as a very active international user base. Um, and then uh, the, the other category is kind of the most interesting here. There's, there's everything from like NASA to NOAA to just private companies. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're, I think providing it as a free tool has really enhanced the popularity because you can try it out and see if, see if it's helpful for you. And yeah, just as another quick overview, some of the different agencies that have sponsored BSP developments in the past, BSP itself has been around since really like the mid 90s in one form or another. It's gotten much more sophisticated over the years. Um, and that's largely due to the fact that the development model is to implement all the, the sponsored features into a single software package that is then better for everyone's use. So for example, the CDC developments in, initially involved some of the building sampling and some of the room visualization. And then in later years, when we were working with DHS to come up with modules to support sampling within a building for chemical or biological incidents, they funded 
the 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 process of taking those to the next level. So I think the key takeaway here is that there's a lot in VSP. Um, there's a lot of different things, but it's been very advantageous to make to make it a more powerful tool in the long run. So some in specific, some of the the radiological applications of VSP. So I guess I should I should jump back and just say there's a there's a lot of different applications of VSP, um, like chemical item sampling, um, all kinds of different hazards. And so we're just focusing on um, a few different aspects of VSP, but there's there's a lot of different things it can be used for. So I think a very common use of VSP and probably what a lot of our users use it for is for these decontamination and decommissioning types of applications. So you need to design a survey or you need to design a sampling plan. Um, often if, if people are following a MARSIM approach, we have a lot of um, methods and tools that are set up to support developing a MARSIM based plan. And we'll talk a little more about that later. Um, as well as doing the data analysis for part of for for those types of surveys. Then um, some of the one of the more recent areas we've expanded use of VSP is into the the area of radiological emergency response. So looking at this is kind of an, a different phase of application where you're not quite trying to do like a clearance or a full remediation, but you want to get a better sense of what's there. You maybe want to characterize. You want to look at your uncertainty and then um, set things up in a way so that you are well positioned to do remediation down the line eventually. So that's a quick overview. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Deb. Um, if you're not familiar with Marsum, she's gonna give kind of a, a summary of that, so. Thanks, Lisa. So um, Marsum is a guidance document um, sponsored by multiple agencies. It started out being uh, DOE, EPA, and NRC. And then in the revision one, Department of Defense joined the party and um, revision two is out for public comment now. And so it will be uh, live soon. And um, one of the things about VSP that's great uh, is that it contains the full capability of the topics that are in the guidance um, in terms of sampling. And Marsum focuses mostly on this uh, final status survey, but um, wherever you are in your decommissioning or decontamination process, if it involves uh, sampling, VSP can help you out. So um, the idea behind Marsum was to develop a consistent approach to the surface. Um, Marsum focuses particularly on buildings and surface soils, but uh, there is a working group in place right now that is um, starting to develop um, methods for the subsurface. And it's, it's a framework, it's a guidance. Um, the subsurface is obviously very complex. And so the working group is um, investigating how broad they want to make the guidance and and how broad the applicability um, they hope it will achieve. Uh, next slide. So um, the data, as Lisa mentioned before, uh, MARSIM is based on the data quality objectives process, which is a also it was developed by EPA back in the 80s to guide um, decontamination and decommissioning activities um, because data were being collected uh, that couldn't really help anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, quantify their uh, uncertainty associated with their decision. So this is kind of the linear uh, DQO process. It's presented linearly, but it's actually very um, iterative and it can, as I said before, it can be applied anywhere in the decommissioning or decontamination process. Um, so it's kind of a thought exercise and it guides people through the different needs for statistically based sampling and uncertainty quantification. Next slide. So I thought uh, we could outline a recent application where VSP was used at PNNL. 
um, the RTL disposition used VSP and the Marsum approach to um, tear down the buildings and verify that um, there was no residual contamination above levels of concern. And so uh, both the sampling plan and the final report are publicly available. The sampling plan, you can see the document number here. Um, I think the uh, final status survey plan, I think that link, if it doesn't appear later in the slides, I can get it for you if you're interested in it. So there are, uh, Marsum covers a couple different scenarios. One, scenario A assumes the site is uh, dirty and tries to show it's clean. And then scenario B assumes the site is clean and tries to verify that with um, adequate statistical power, which is kind of a jargon term, but it basically means to collect a number of samples to have confidence that you're not leaving anything behind. And um, again, VSP is very decision driven. And so um, in developing this sampling plan, the decision was going to be based on either the mean or the median concentration of several COPCs. And those were um, means or medians were going to be compared to thresholds calculated based on a dose limit. Next slide. So um, typically, when uh, you're doing this kind of approach, um, you will divide your site up into decision units. And so this is just an example of some of the decision units that were used at RTL. And you can do a separate DQO process for each decision unit, or you can combine them together. Um, but the number of samples is then based on each individual decision unit. So here we have the main building, and then we have an area within that building that was a lab, that's B. And then C was other structures, D was uh, the piping, and then E and F were the surrounding areas, the parking lot and land. So again, uh, VSP would produce uh, um, suggested sampling locations and number of samples for each of these decision units. And then that is um, documented in the report generator. Next. So this gives you an idea of where the samples were collected and what kind of samples they were. So the red dots represent um, systematic or judgmental sampling locations. So those would be considered bias locations where you're sampling where you think there is the highest probability of contamination. And then the blue dots represent random samples uh, that help you get that statistical confidence that you want. And so there are methods for um, combining both judgmental and random samples to arrive at a confidence statement. Oh yeah, and here we go. The final status survey report link is given in the last bullet, um, which is a, also publicly available. So uh, you, can, you can look at that if you'd like to see more detail. And then just to, um, to say, oh, sorry, Lisa. <laughs> just to say for, for this particular site, during the decontamination process, it was successful because in the final status survey, no uh, survey unit exceeded the decision criteria um, with the stated statistical confidence um, that was negotiated. Okay, next slide. So this is just a kind of a transition into how can VSP possibly be utilized in the subsurface. And so this is a REMPLEX slide that covers um, the areas where uh, PNNL has sort of the state of the science. And VSP is particularly useful in the first column, the nature and extent column, and then in the end state. Um, so in the nature and extent, um, if you're doing sampling to determine um, characterization uh, of your COPCs, you could use VSP there. And then whatever your objective end state, objective, sorry, objective end state is, um, you can 
use VSP to help you verify that at the end. Uh, next slide. So there um, are some geospatial tools we'd like to outline that are in Visual Sample Plan. There are a number of spatial interpolation methods. Um, there's uh, nearest neighbor and inverse distance weighting, which are not um, considered in the jargon um, to be geostatistical analysis. However, they do have a statistical basis. So um, nearest neighbor uses uh, polygons where the polygons are drawn such that the boundaries um, are defined by the data that you've already collected. And then decisions are made on a polygon basis. And so this is mostly useful when you are interested in classification. Uh, so is an area above a threshold or not, where the area under consideration is one of those polygons. And then inverse distance weighting is similar to Krieging, which we'll get into here next. And it is a parametric method, which means that um, there is some work to be done to estimate the model parameters. Um, and it's similar to Krieging in that it weights the observations based on their distance to the area that you want to interpolate. So what this um, um, does is it creates a grid that uh, you can kind of see as pixels in these plots. And it um, takes the data that were collected at the black dots and then interpolates concentrations throughout for every uh, grid cell. Um, so once you've gotten, and then, and then it does Krieging as well, the last geo um, statistical analysis, it does several different kinds of Krieging. Um, and then we also have plans to expand that for that subsurface MARSUM um, that we're, that we're working on now. So once you've gotten your uh, predicted surface, your interpolated surface, you can use VSP to draw different contours um, in that surface. And the interesting thing about the um, figure on the right is that you'll notice there are some circles that are around data points where so they're kind of, uh, you know, hills in your um, interpolated surface. And that that the size of that circle is really related to the Krieging model that you use. And um, so the contours are not always uh, smooth in the sense that you get this nice contiguous area of contamination. Um, the other thing that it allows you to do is to compare Krieging methods and compare your Krieging models. Uh, this figure in the bottom center is a histogram of differences between two models and their creek estimates. And so that gives you kind of a sensitivity analysis and uh, will help you settle on a creek model. And then finally, the creaking, whatever geospatial interpolation method you use, the uh, results are exportable um, in the ASC format. Next slide. So if you choose something like Krieging as opposed to um, uh, polygons or inverse distance weighting, Krieging also gives you estimates of the prediction uncertainty at the locations where you don't have data. And so what results is an interpolated concentration surface or volume. This can be done in 2 or 3D. Um, and then an associated uncertainty surface or volume. And so that can be used to help you um, make decisions about whether you need to add sampling locations or in your um, remediation decisions uh, can help you guide those. And so um, probability and uncertainty maps are really based on the conditional variance where the variance is conditioned on the data that you've observed, um, which is that's kind of an esoteric concept, but um, 
it really means that the variance will change uh, as you add data points. Uh, next slide. And then it also uh, um, gives you this reference uncertainty index, which is related to um, uncertainty surfaces. However, it is it sort of gives you a probability map. So your reference scale is always going to be zero to one. And the probability that is presented is the probability of exceeding a given threshold in a particular cell. So in this case, we show the dialog box where people have chosen a threshold of six um, unitless at this point. Um, and then using simple Krieging, which is the, probably the most widely used Krieging model, um, you can get a probability of exceeding that value at every grid node or every cell um, in your interpolation surface. So um, this is also, again, good at making uh, guiding decisions or identifying additional sampling locations. And I think here, um, one thing that we should say is that the Krieging that VSP does so far, um, Krieging is based on the spatial correlation of the data. And the underlying assumption is that data that are closer together in space are more highly correlated than data than locations that are far apart in space. And so the simplest Krieging model uses what's all called isotropy which is best um, illustrated by dropping a pebble in a pond and the waves from the pebble go out in every direction with an equal velocity. That's called isotropy. Anisotropy would be um, if you drop the pebble in the pond and the waves propagate in, in say a north-south direction faster than the east-west direction. And so uh, that is called anisotropy. And right now, VSP does um, isotropic Krieging in two dimensions. Uh, but we are funded from NRC uh, very soon here to implement uh, anisotropic Krieging in two dimensions and then expanding the Krieging algorithm into three dimensions. And so Theoretically, you can get a correlation structure that looks like an amoeba as opposed to a target, you know, kind of a target. But realistically, um, the best Krieging model, you, the least complicated Krieging model um, that incorporates anisotropy would be an ellipse where you have, it doesn't have to be uh, particularly orthogonal. Um, directions, but you can you can identify two or three directions um, where the correlation structure in the data is is different from the others. So for instance, if you know the groundwater flow direction, you can use that as the long axis of an ellipse. Um, and then you could use the short axis as being something perpendicular to groundwater flow. Okay, uh, next slide. So here is just an example that shows uh, kind of a sensitivity analysis of the Krieging algorithms. So what you have here is a 2D surface and the yellow line represents the a contour, so connected um, grid nodes uh, for a certain concentration. And then what the brownish line represents is the uncertainty in that estimate. So if you were trying to make a decision about the size of an area to remediate with some level of confidence, you would use that brown line because the uncertainty associated with the estimates is reflected um, in that line. And then, um, so on the top panel, we have many transects, which might be hard to see in this picture, but the little black dots would be the transects. And um, 
So you can see that the uncertainty is, is very close to the, closely follows the contour. And then if you remove transects in the second and third panels, you can see how the uncertainty associated with your uh, area boundaries grows and smooths out. And that is a direct uh, reflection of the Krieging model that you used and the transects that you have. So um, for this example, uh, depending on the number of transects that you actually have um, and the Krieging model that you've chosen, you can make some kind of statement like uh, for a given location outside that boundary, there's a 95% confidence that you have not exceeded some action limit. So again, in terms of guiding remediation or even possibly determining additional sample locations, um, this method is, is useful. Next slide. So a little bit about what's coming down the road. Um, a lot of times, um, we are using different instrumentation to collect data at the same site. So this is an example where we have both aerial transects and walkover transects. And mathematically, those can be combined in a Krieging model using this fixed rank Krieging algorithm. And, and so what it allows you to do is take different fields of view for uh, data collected with different instruments and combine them into a single Krieging surface and a single uncertainty surface. Um, so in that way, it um, not only allows different spatial resolution instruments to be used in a, to achieve a single decision, but it also reflects the uncertainty in each of those collection methods. So fixed rank Krieging is a direction that we are going. It's, it's in a beta version in VSP now, but one of the goals is to get that um, tuned up and into a final release version. Um, okay, next slide. So this is just another example of where uh, fixed rank Krieging might be useful. So, and again, this is a 2D surface where data were collected um, on the solid transects using an ATV. And then aerial data were collected. Again, it's hard to see, but the, the transects with the black dots and the uncertainty, or sorry, the um, contoured concentrations using both of those data sets. Uh, next slide. So uh, one of the things about fixed rank Krieging is there's a user defined parameter which lets you sort of get at the resolution that you want to predict at. So at the top, um, it's a very smoothly changing concentration service. And in the bottom right, it's a much more irregular surface. And so one of the sort of tuning parameters that you need to, to use in fixed rank Krieging is deciding what resolution of um, Krieging that you, an uncertainty that you want to model. And then based on that, that resolution, um, what are additional sampling locations or what is the resulting uncertainty? Next slide. Other things that we're working on for VSP so a lot of training gets sponsored by federal agencies, uh, particularly NRC and DOE. Um, we do two training courses a year with NRC that they pay for. Um, we do sort of uh, DOE semi-regularly training um, opportunities. But one thing that we are developing is um, with, with uh, Pacific Northwest Site Office. Uh, which um, drives what PNNL approves what PNNL works on. We're developing a, a contracting mechanism so that uh, contractors or non-federal sponsors, international sponsors, can sign up for training and um, pay for it that way. 
um, without having to go through a federal sponsor. So our website will hopefully very soon be having that information on it where we will advertise a class and people can sign up for it. And if we get a certain uh, lower limit of people interested in taking it, we'll offer it. Or people can request if they have a large group that wants training, uh, they can request training on a particular topic. Relative to the subsurface, um, again, I mentioned we're starting to work with NRC on this subsurface MARSM approach. Um, and so we do have some VSP related things we're doing before that guidance is even written. And a lot of those deal with um, like, how do you track uh, ground well water data within VSP? Um, because it might not just be a vertical uh, groundwater well or borehole. Um, and so the XYZ locations need to, to follow that, that groundwater well designation. There are some other bookkeeping things that we're also working on cleaning up in preparation for that. And then also expanded geospatial analysis, which I touched on before, including 3D Krieging, anisotropic Krieging, Bayesian Krieging, which um, will be a way to implement prior information into the Krieging model. And then some of our international sponsors are um, sponsoring work to improve the visualization for buildings and structures and outdoor areas, um, and then making it easier for furniture and materials inside those structures to be modeled and potentially sampled. Next slide. So I think that's it. Uh, here's information on how to uh, register and download VSP. We have uh, us and some other people um, have written uh, YouTube videos where you can go out and see different aspects of VSP and get, get ideas of how to use it. You can always email us for general VSP help and questions. Um, you can do VSP at pnnl.gov and that gets answered by Lisa or one of her other um, computer science colleagues uh, or forwarded to another person, or you can reach out to us individually here. Next slide. Excellent. Well, thanks, Deb and Lisa. Um, with that, I'm going to start some q and I um, had a couple questions come through the chat, so we can start off with those. Um, one question that came in the chat was, can the Krieging results, in particular the point-wise variance, be overlaid with the previous sampling design section? I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to let Lisa uh, answer that one. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say the answer is is yes in in some very kind of specific ways. So the the, the methods that we have to support that there's, there's one design that takes that reference uncertainty index and uses that to determine like where to optimally place new samples. So that's kind of a very specific use case. It was kind of designed around groundwater wells where, you know, if you're trying to like outline some kind of boundary or, or contour, um, where do you need to add more wells in order to do that? Um, but it could be used with any type of situation where you're looking at adding specific additional locations. And then, kind of conversely, the, the or the the inverse of that problem is when, if you're if you're looking at which of your locations are redundant, so which ones are do you could you like remove from service, or which ones could you get rid of? So that's kind of very focused on the groundwater uh, monitoring application. Um, in general, yeah, as far as just in general using the pointwise variance of the creating to guide sampling, that's not something that we've developed really explicit methods for it's certainly kind of like the workflow that I think people end up going through is you do this Krieging uh, you maybe delineate some kind of a contour um, you maybe look at like the the that reference uncertainty index and use that to guide how you like divide up your sampling but yeah I would say the, the whole concept of using Krieging and the variance to guide further sampling is is something that we're much we're very interested in doing kind of more development to do. So that's kind of an answer. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Another question, we have an audience member from Germany, welcome. And they are wondering if 
training is available for foreign nationals? So under this new training model that we are getting approved with our um, DOE oversight, yes, anybody can participate in or request training. Um, so either a training that is advertised on the site, uh, the website, or training that you solicit if you have a group of people that want to attend. Um, so yes to international. I think some um, countries might have to go through some additional approvals, but in general, absolutely. Great. All right. Uh, another question is related to the versioning. And so right now we see that VSP is at version 7.16. And do you have a timeline for version 8.0 coming up soon? Yes, <laughs> sort of. So um, if you look at the user's manual, you will see that it is the user's manual for version 7.0. And we were at 7.16 now. So uh, typically what happens is we have these um, inter uh, version releases that update certain aspects based on what sponsors have funded. And we don't necessarily update the user guide every time. Um, so, if, so we are in dire need of a version 8.0 upgrade. And that means a revision of the user's manual and documentation. And um, we are working with our sponsors to get funding to do this. And it's going to be expensive. And so uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, we'll achieve that. I think it will, I think that it will be a sort of incremental approach to doing that. And I just wanted to add, we do, for, for most of the new modules that do get added in like the 7.15 or 7.16 versions, the, the, the help within the software is updated. But yeah, as far as that, like the comprehensive user manual, um, yeah, that's a good thing to be aware of that it's not updated until the major releases. Okay, great. Um, I have two more questions here. Is there a way to incorporate information from subsurface modeling into Kriging? So that is one of the things we're trying to tackle with this subsurface MARSUM. And one of the ways we can do that is through Bayesian approach to Kriging, where um, a Bayesian statistics is fundamentally different than um, the statistics, frequency-based statistics, which uh, most people are familiar with, in that it assigns uh, distributions to the parameters in a model. And one way that you can get a distribution for a parameter is through information from a subsurface model. So, um, so yes, uh, I think that as the complexity of your modeling increases, um, of course, it's going to be uh, more tricky to do that. So we're trying to work through all that now. All right, and last question. Um, so VSP allows for biased or targeted and random sampling in 2D surface applications. Is there a way to do this in the subsurface? So there's a very particular algorithm um, that is used to combine the biased and random samples in 2D surfaces. Kriging is a little bit different in that when it was developed, um, it was originally developed by uh, people in France who wanted to get at um, ore deposits. And so it is fundamentally a subsurface uh, technique. And the assumptions in Krieging are based on only the locations between the data, not how those locations were selected. And so as long as the concept the concentration um, at a certain location is normally distributed, meaning if you wanted to do some kind of modeling, the residuals would be normally distributed. That's the major assumption of Krieging. And so there is no um, additional work needed to combine sort of uh, targeted and random samples. Um, so Again, we're working on fixed rank Krieging. You might say that the uncertainty associated with different locations is different. Um, and so it, as we're working to improve the fixed rank Krieging capability in VSP, 
we will sort of get at that part of that question too. Great. All right. Well, with that, um, I want to thank everyone for joining today. And I just want to send, um, give you a reminder that we're going to uh, archive this seminar on the Remplex website. We encourage you to sign up for the newsletter by sending an email to remplex at pnnl.gov to join the LinkedIn group using the link in the chat. And before we end, I'd like to turn it over to Nick Kafoku from PNNL uh, to briefly talk about the Remplex 2021 Global Summit on Environmental Remediation that is currently being planned. Uh, so Nick, can you say a few words? Yeah, definitely. Only a couple of words. Uh, we are excited that we are organizing the Global Summit um, in November, from November 7th through, through 12th. Uh, there will be a couple of case studies focused on different sites like Hanford, um, Fukushima, or Sellafield in UK for that matter. We will have panel discussions as well. And of course, we now have opened the abstract submission process for the technical sessions. And the technical sessions will be focusing on subsurface remote sensing, on multi-scale modeling and upscaling, Another session is going to be about big data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning for environmental remediation. Another session will be about environmental sensors. And of course, we will be touching on emerging contaminants of concerns as well. So I encourage everyone to have a look at our technical um, program and then consider submitting an abstract. Um, the abstract submission is going to remain open until September 15th. And if you have any questions about um, the summit, please do not hesitate to shoot us a message, either to me, Alicia, or, um, or Karen Smith as well, who is the three of us, we are working to put together the program for this summit. I hope you will join us. <clears throat> Great, well, thank you, Nick. Thank you to Deb and Lisa, and thank you for everyone for joining the seminar today. Have a great day.